Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Emanuela Tarizzo, and I'm Gallery Director at Tommaso Brothers Fine Art. On behalf of my colleagues on the board of London Art Week, I would like to welcome you to the first of our Winter Symposium panels on Raphael, which I've had the pleasure of organizing with Anna da Benedetti, a curator of the Raphael Cartoons project at the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, whom you will hear in tomorrow's panel. And I just uh, want to take this opportunity to remind you that um, tomorrow's and Thursday's panels um, are still open for registration on our website. So if you haven't already done so and you'd like to join us for tomorrow and Thursday as well, please do so. Um, and now uh, I think with, without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to Thomas Marx, who is editor of Apollo magazine and will be moderating today's panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emanuela. Um, as Emanuela says, I'm, I'm Tom Marx, the editor of Apollo magazine. Um, we're going to be talking today about the extent to which the planned Raphael celebrations to mark a 500th anniversary of his death uh, were carried off, uh, the extent to which they were disrupted, the extent to which somehow um, institutions, curators, academic scholars were able to supersede uh, or, or to um, uh, themselves deflect the events of this year to celebrate Raphael. But also I want to make sure that we talk a bit about the image of Raphael that we've had in this 500th uh, anniversary of his death. I, I start just with this image before I introduce the speakers, um, just to say this was my real experience of Raphael at 500. Unfortunately, I arrived in Rome a week too late in February to make the grand unveiling of Raphael's tapestries designed for the Acts of the Apostles series for the Vatican, and a week too early or 10 days too early for the great exhibition at the Scuderia del Quirinale in Rome. But I add the image of the Galatea at the Farnesina Villa uh, in Trastevere, just to provoke slightly to think about whether perhaps this year we've all had an image of Raphael behind bars or whether for many of us Raphael has somehow been able to shine through those bars. I know that in particular this uh, was part of a non-invasive treatment. It was my misfortune to come across the Galatea with the bars in front of it and it led to some discoveries later in the year which are now on display at the Farnesina. Exhibitions have opened, exhibitions have closed. At the Scuderia, the exhibition opened, closed, and was opened again in our new world of social distancing. And as I mentioned, at the Vatican for a week, the Acts of the Apostles tapestries were hung in the Sistine Chapel. Other major events have been postponed, among them the major Raphael show in London at the National Gallery, which will now take place in 2022, the redisplay of the Raphael cartoons at the V&A, which will hopefully be visible from January. In fact, if you wanted to find Raphael in the United Kingdom this year in a special display, you need to go to Woking uh, for a display on Prince Albert and Raphael with uh, many drawings from the Royal Collection, which if you're hungering after Raphael and you're in the audience uh, tonight, you can go to again from this Thursday when it reopens at the light box. Let me introduce our speakers. Uh, our panel this evening is Dr. Matteo Lanfranconi, the director of the Scuderia del Quirinale since 2013, previously in charge of the Palazzo delle Esposizioni in Rome. Uh, he was the curator this year of Raphael 1520 to 1483, a huge exhibition with more than 200 works from around the world, extraordinary loans, uh, and I think we'll hear in a minute from him about uh, putting that together. We have Dr. Ka uh, Professor Catherine Whistler, Keeper of Western Art at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Uh, Catherine um, has, uh, was a co-curator of Raphael drawings at the Ashmolean in 2017. Incidentally, Apollo's exhibition of the year that year uh, and uh, has curated many exhibitions, including drawing in Venice, Titian to Canaletto, and she's published widely on these subjects, as well as cataloging the Baroque and later paintings at the Ashmolean. Professor Tom Henry, uh, is Emeritus Professor of History of Art at the University of Kent and the Director of the Italian Renaissance Documents site. Uh, he also has published widely on Raphael and other artists of the period, notably Luca Signorelli, 
Uh, he co-curated late Raphael at the Prado in 2012 to 13, and with David Exurgeon, is co-curator of the Raphael exhibition at the National Gallery, which hasn't happened yet, but will happen. So those are our speakers' credentials, and I'm going to leap straight in. I'll just let everyone know in the audience that we'll be talking probably for about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, and um, if then anyone wants to ask questions, they should add them in the Q&A box on Zoom. We'll leave some time at the end to answer uh, a number of those questions. So please do jump in. I've asked all our speakers to give us just a handful of images that will somehow encapsulate for them what it's meant to celebrate Raphael this year. So I'm gonna take the bars away from Raphael and uh, hand over to you, Matteo. Can you tell, talk us through your images? Here I am. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom, for inviting. And uh, my sequence of pictures is uh, the sort of resume of my experience, my roller coaster during the Raphael year. The first one is the is the representing the, the black clothes covering all the works for conservation reason immediately after the declaration of lockdown in early March. So three days after the opening of the show. It was a moment of tremendous disbelief and frustration and fear, perhaps. And uh, this image is, um, is very I mean, powerful in terms of emotions and uh, uh, also because of the overlapping of this feeling of mourning, the feeling of griefing, and the participation of the show to the darkness of that moment. Uh, we sent out a, some of them because also from, for, from making sure that we were protecting the lawns, but they were very sensational for the audience also in terms of symbols. Uh, the second uh, image I wanted to show you is again an image uh, quite um, beautiful, but also related to the sense of uh, loneliness and uh, griefing of the lockdown. This is this picture is the Pantheon taken uh, taken in um, April the sixth, the day of the death of Raphael. This is a kind courtesy of a common friend, uh, Frank Tabel, who was I mean lucky enough to live uh, very close to the Pantheon, so to counterfeit a, a visit to the tomb as if it was a sort of a walking around the corner with the dog, the only one who had this privilege. So he took this picture and uh, nobody of us could uh, repeat the ritual of going to the Pantheon in the, this is so special year. And it is also meaningful in terms of symbols. I mean, people was dying in the hospital in complete loneliness. And this is the image of the tomb of Raphael, of this temple hosting the tomb of Raphael in complete loneliness in the day of five, 500 years after his death. I think this is very, very strong as image. The next one, I, I talk about roller coaster. <laughs> and this is, I mean, one month after the, the reopening of the show, we had this man, I mean, begging for uh, tickets. It was immediately after the, we had, I mean, weekly sold out. I mean, it was impossible to, to, to buy a ticket for the same day or the same week. And so people, people willing to meet Raphael. This was a sort of redemption after the incredible three months of lockdown. And also in terms of empathy, this was a real challenge we had for, for, for the celebrations to go back to a sort of public empathy to the idea of Raphael and to the idea of his art. And I think this peaceful but passionate uh, tribute to, to the exhibition was, uh, was one of the main success we, we had in, during these times. The fourth one is, uh, uh, is, is taken the last day of the opening of the show, it means uh, August the 30th. But is the time which is significant because I mean the picture is taken at 3:27 a.m. We had in the last week uh, uh, H24 opening, and we had 10 people each five minutes for H24 climbing the hill of the Quirinal to visit Raphael. And this was really, I mean, it's not, not perhaps the first time that uh, for a night opening for a, for a blockbuster show. 
but in this special year for this special uh, artist in those special circumstances, I think the, 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 the patience of the people doing that I and mean, then very, very calmly, very peacefully, but very passionately was a proof of uh, a part of, at least of the success of the celebration. And I wanted to share with you this uh, sort of uh, um, sequence. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Matteo. And it, it really interesting to hear uh, you talk about somehow this need for empathy in, in looking at Raphael at certain points this year, perhaps whether that's something that has come out of the exhibitions and events that have happened, that vision of, of Raphael is something we can talk about. But can I just first ask you, Matteo, uh, before I move on to Catherine, to, to explain to people how it is you happen to be sort of at Raphael's tomb as you speak? Um, this is, is a long, it's, it's a long story. Uh, Raphael experience was a, it was a three years long uh, um, challenge. It was extremely difficult to put together all the project. It was difficult also to 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 keep together the group. <laughs> that was, of course, I mean, um, a, a lot of people talking and fighting around Raphael. So it was all. Everything was very difficult. But I mean, it was also quite interesting to see how easy, on the contrary, it was to, um, to, uh, to, make, to, to make sure that the, the, uh, the show was, could reopen. After three after years of negotiation of the loans, we had one week need of one week to have the confirmation of all of the loans for the new, for the new um, timing with the show after three months. So it's a lot of, a very long law. And this uh, uh, was a proof of a big change for the sense of community and the participation and solidarity that all the scholars and the director of museum institution uh, felt around the, 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 the special circumstance, circumstances. It was, a, um, we we're lucky of course for the, for the show, but all the community uh, um, was uh, was uh, had the benefit to to change this, the feeling of uh, how to do, to be together around Raphael, the idea of Raphael after years in years of uh, contrast and uh, perhaps also a, a, a loss of interest sometimes. I'm, I'm going to move on to Catherine, uh, and then we'll come back to discuss these things again. Catherine, your images. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I chose two images from the Ashmolean's wonderful collection of Raphael drawings, partly thinking about London Art Week, actually, this year in July, as well as now, and thinking about all the wonderful um, encounters one has with art lovers, with collectors, with drawing specialists, with all our friends the, the, in, in the art market, the dealers, and what fun it is to talk about drawings together when we do all um, bump into each other in the, in the course of these weeks. However, as, as Tom said in introducing me, we did of course have um, a major drawings exhibition at the Ashmolean in 2017 and research has been continuing um, to an extent since then. And not being, I don't, this is a bit of a shameless plug for a book on Raphael drawing and eloquence that's about to appear. So in the Raphael year, um, edited by me and by my co-curator of the exhibition, Ben Thomas. The reason I'm mentioning this is the drawing in front of you on the screen is one that figures in two of the essays in this book. And it's the point I want to make really is now that no matter how familiar we think we are with Raphael, with great drawings, there's always something new to discover, something new to, to say. In this case, as I say, it's a very familiar image. The black chalk study relates to Raphael's ideas uh, for the disputa and traditionally the ink study of the female nude has been related to his initial thoughts of the Parnassus. We're certainly in this great moment of creativity where he's rising to the challenge of the whole decoration of the Stanza della Senatura. And creativity is also there in that his ambition in terms of creativity, but also in terms of his courtly image and that he's composing rather fiercely, lots of crossings out and rethinking, he's composing poetry. So this sheet speaks to us about Raphael's ambition, about his complexity as an artist, and the complexity of the drawing itself, with all the different media on the sheet. You have this great sense, I think, of his inventiveness, a kind of 
wired up energy and also an element of wit and playfulness in the juxtaposition of the studies. But importantly, in this book, um, Francesco Paolo di Teodoro, um, an Italian scholar who's worked extensively on Raphael's writings, has written and is, has, is making new observations about his poetry as in these drafts on the Ashmolean sheets. Um, and another contributor, Angela Maria Aceto, who's from the Ashmolean, has actually found new drawings on this sheet. She's been able to trace um, the what's been partly seen, but not fully seen until now, Raphael's work in blind stylus, and she has lots of interesting observations and discoveries in relation to this sheet. So there's always something new to say about Raphael. And my second image is one of the most famous uh, works and um, the greatest drawing perhaps by well, the greatest drawing I think by Raphael but perhaps the great one of the greatest drawings in the world and I think again this just reminds us why we're celebrating Raphael's achievement in this anniversary year. Um, this is a sublime drawing it's hugely elaborate of course part of the intensive preparatory process for his extraordinarily important transfiguration altarpiece comes at a very late stage where Raphael is actually drawing over pounced dots that result from the transfer of a thought through linear design. But in this substantial sheet, it's a large drawing, we see the artist at his most concentrated and his most empathetic. And I think empathy here, as we mentioned already, is really important in relation to this sheet. We can see his intelligence at work as he's focusing on defining these two contrasting personalities. It's an enormously time consuming drawing. Raphael really pulling out the full potential of this black chalk, this earthy material, which he's using in quick, grainy strokes for you know, the springing hair of the characters. He's using in incredibly delicate ways. If you just look at the eyelashes of the young man and he's using it in very, very rich ways for modeling the forms. I think above all, we can see and feel here how Raphael has this amazing capacity somehow to internalize the thoughts and the feelings, what Leonardo called the, the multi-mentality, the, the sort of mental states, the psychological states of his protagonists, these protagonists in his spiritual drama of the painting. So that making the drawing involves him in a kind of yeah, internalization, a prof really profound exploration of their contrasting characters, personalities, psychology, and as it were, the act of drawing enables him to, to produce this empathetic response that affects us truly uh, deeply. It's a remarkable drawing for that kind of expressive effect it has. I have seen students and people of all ages look at this drawing in our print room sure. and sometimes the tears start to come. So I think this is why we're celebrating Raphael. You know, he died when he's still a young artist. He's 37. Think of, you know, what would he have done given that he was capable of this kind of achievement? Where would he have gone? Thank you. Tom, let me turn to your images. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. And thank you, Tom, for um, introducing us and inviting me to take part. Um, my images really go to what I thought were the emotional high points of the year. Um, and I start with the experience of being in the Sistine Chapel on the evening of the 17th of February. Um, partly for on, in the slide on the left, being in a group of people, it was a, it was a, that everyone was excited to be there. This was um, one of the events associated with the hanging of the Vatican tapestries in the Sistine Chapel for the first time in a very long time, just for this one week. And that was, it felt wonderful to see that experience. I had never seen it before. Uh, and it really did make one better understand the tapestries, Raphael's thinking as he prepared them. Uh, and it seemed like the most exciting introduction to what at that point we thought was going to be a spectacular year of um, 
events, exhibitions, um, conversations, um, and it was really a very, very exciting moment. My next three slides are all of the exhibition at the Scuderia del Quirinale, uh, which was clearly the other great moment um, of the year for Rafael and for experiencing Rafael. Um, perhaps if things had gone differently, I would have put in an installation shot of the uh, exhibition that I'm co-curating with David Exergen for the National Gallery. Um, but I hope we will also talk about uh, this as not being an opportunity lost, but as an opportunity, I'm going to say, extended. Um, I see the Raphael anniversary as spanning right from the exhibitions that started in Urbino in late 2019, uh, through now at least until the rearranged dates of the National Gallery exhibition, which are the um, 19th of March to the 10th of June, uh, 2022, so 18 months away. Um, the three slides I put in specifically for Matteo's show really go to things that I think it did so brilliantly and that it um, that would be very hard for anyone else to do, but also leaving us room to discuss some other uh, aspects of the exhibition. Uh, so here it is one of the Factum Arte uh, replicas um, made of the tapestry cartoons in the V&A, uh, shown on the opposite wall there was uh, the Vatican Museum's tapestry of the sacrifice at Lystra, uh, this then representing, I thought splendidly, but also controversially because it does introduce uh, effectively modern replicas into what is otherwise an exhibition of um, original works of art, shown here with a first century um, altar. And it's such a wonderful evocation of the role of the antique in Raphael's work that it's such an effective presentation and explanation of the, the Vatican tapestries. I thought that was absolutely wonderful, uh, but not without being controversial. And then the second slide, uh, of my group of three from the exhibition um, was really just again to point to the combinations that were possible in 2020 that were neither possible nor indeed um, uh, attempted in the last major anniversary exhibitions of 1983 and that is putting uh, paintings and drawings and sculpture together so again the sculpture on the right ahead of Isis from Naples. Uh, you don't quite get it here from the scale, but the kind of uh, knotted hair that she has is exactly what is uh, then pursued by Raphael in his figure of um, Saint Cecilia. Uh, show, so showing the sculpture with the painting, and then to the left of the painting showing uh, a modello drawing. Um, and again, I wanted to put in something that we could perhaps return to discuss because not everybody accepts this drawing in the Petit Palais uh, as by Raphael. And so there is some controversy associated with some of the, the attributions. And then Tom, if you go to my last slide, um, this I took on the night of the opening. Um, Matteo missed the opening of his own show by being unwell. So I sent this to him to cheer him up. Um, and uh, I think it, just gives you a sense of um, the excitement that was at that point gathering in Italy around this anniversary, around what it could be, around what it meant for Italy. Perhaps Matteo will offer us some comment on that, including the efforts to, to reopen the exhibition. And again, uh, in a year where we could find negatives, I find positives. And if I were to draw strands from um, the two previous introductions to this evening's conversation, uh, I'm reminded of the way uh, Vasari and others, in fact, commented on how Raphael could bring harmony to places where harmony did not always reign, and whether that is uh, lenders all agreeing to uh, leave their works in Rome for an extended period, uh, or indeed 
the calming effect that I think the exhibition visibly had on people who visited it and the, and the demand through the night to go and see it, I think uh, it's one of the things that proves to me the ongoing currency of Raphael uh, and again seems to me a positive note. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to uh, remove the images so that we can see everybody um, properly. Um, I, I wanted to pick up that point uh, um, about, about what this celebration has meant for Italy this year. In a sense, when these huge anniversary celebrations uh, take place, they're often seen as very international events, but a lot of us have been um, prohibited from traveling this year because of uh, regulations. Ma Matteo, for you, um, was this uh, Raphael at 500 a particularly Italian celebration or um, how has the anniversary been received in Italy during this challenging year for the country? Uh, first of all, I mean, perhaps um, the most part of you can remember that Scuderie Quirinale itself is, uh, is devoted to celebrate, I mean, big anniversary of the country being, I mean, part of the expression of the Quirinal presidency of the Republic. So after Ovid in uh, 2018 and after Leonardo in 2019, we had Raphael in 2020 and we will be having Dante the next year. So it seems to be <laughs> the, the, the professionalism of, I mean, big anniversaries. Uh, it's controversial, it's not easy at all, and uh, not, it's not always given for granted to have good results. But for as far as Raphael is involved, I have to say that we have to, to regain a huge disadvantage I mean, organizing this show, especially because of its closeness, historical closeness, to the anniversary of the death of Leonardo. Uh, which is I mean, a, a figure much more popular and uh, very different in the way in which he is popular. And uh, so all during the year, the preceding years, I mean, it was very difficult to persuade people in Italy of the importance of this event. Everyone was, I mean, was speaking about Leonardo and how much Italy could could be able to celebrate Leonardo while uh, France was doing major show on, on him. And so it was a uh, very, very um, continuous obstacles to, for the organization and for um, asking people to pay attention, as it organized and institutions, lenders to pay attention to that and to believe in the importance of this anniversary. Uh, at the same time, uh, we had the luck to organize a sort of uh, counterattack, and uh, in a few months, I would say in a few weeks, we realized that um, forgetting decades of uh, loss of um, empathy, loss of um, um, closeness of the people to the idea of classical idea and, and, and Raphael himself, we, uh, we um, recorded and in immediately increasing of attention, and, and especially in the sense that Raphael, the meaning of Raphael art, something uh, universal, something speaking in a wide uh, in a wide language to everyone, speaking of beauty and speaking of uh, peace sometimes, and uh, this was immediately something uh, um, that we recorded in the attention of the public. We had one hundred thousand booking for the show during February. Uh, the funny thing, uh, funny, uh, funny thing is that during uh, the month of, I mean, I would say December 2019, 2019 we had a major um, airline company from China asking us for a sponsor to, to provide us with a sponsorship. I'm, I'm quoting now, saying that people of China were so much interested in, in visiting Rafael. So we, we thought to be immediately overwhelmed by millions and millions of, of, of people from abroad. And it was, it was funny, it was uh, really unexpected. And uh, this was amazing. Uh, Catherine, let me ask you, um, I, I, I presume that you've been somewhere in or near Oxford most of this mm. year. 
Um, it, it must be quite challenging in such an important year uh, for um, Italian Renaissance studies to, to not have been able to travel to Italy very much. So what, what's it been like thinking about this Raphael anniversary from, from, a, from a distance, as it were? You're right. I mean, I have had to be very much um, an armchair traveller, uh, as you were, Tom. Um, I also fell slightly ill in February, late February, and so missed what I would have longed to have seen, what Tom talked about, um, the hanging of the tapestries in the Sistine Chapel. So for me, I've enjoyed you know, the short films, there's a whole load of films out there where you can, you know, keep watching. You can, you, you, you get a sense of what it was like and you get a sense of the extraordinary sort of scale and colour of, of all of this. Again, um, I suppose I find it frustrating. There are other major things you talked about, the Villa Farnesina, obviously the Sala di Costantino. Uh, was unveiled after major, again, conservation work that saw it sort of closed off from view for a long time. So one, so I've been delving into what's available online to see, again, what I can see. Um, and there too, one realizes, you know, the need to be there because of the, the color, the color and the, you know, just, just the, 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 vis the sheer visual impact. And one can um, go on and on. I mean, I think, um, Yes, it's been it's been good for exploring um, digital offerings. Um, I've certainly liked sort of poking into, you know, odd corners here and there where one finds um, unexpected uh, talks and lectures. Maybe I followed something recently, which was a lovely um, a series about um, mostre negate, so the idea of the cancelled exhibition and can we have the curator's talk instead. And there's a lovely um, film that, that uh, which was embedded in one of the uh, presentations, which gave you a little tour, a little mini tour of an exhibition in Bologna about Raphael and his impact in 16th century prints. So again, you know, I'm never going to see that show, but I think there's there's a little bit of consolation, but it, it doesn't make up for not being there in person to experience the magic, the enchantment of the actual work and the things that we all miss talking about works together and exploring the, you know, the juxtapositions that happen um, only in exhibitions. So that that has been very much missed. I, 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 won't, I won't ask, particularly about digital projects specific mm. to exhibitions this year, because you've just mentioned a, a couple of them. It, it strikes me anyway that, you know, there's no difference between what one might do for, for a Raphael exhibition as a digital walkthrough or what one might have done at an exhibition at Tate Modern, say, or, or at the Met or something like this. But, but what I will ask about is, um, to, to, to you, perhaps I'll ask you, Tom, uh, first, with, with some artists, we've had things like Take the Closer to Van Eyck project and this sharing of images, high resolution images, information, conservation images, um, documentation, archival material. H have you felt that to a certain degree that there's a, perhaps a lack of collaboration in some way about what's available, what's out there, if you want to look closer at Raphael this year online? Uh, I wouldn't put it quite in those terms. Um, I think that what uh, what I do notice is that the the holdings of Raphael around the world are extremely scattered and in different conditions and institutions in different um, states of their, uh, as it were, their their IT evolution. Um, and that creates data that is not very readily comparable. Um, and I think that does cr create an obstacle to some of the comparison I think you uh, would like to see and that perhaps is being achieved for, for other artists. Um, I think that the uh, area where I see very good progress, uh, and that's not to say that it's reached its, its end point, but it, it's good progress, is on the documentary. Uh, where building on Sherman's volumes and particularly building on, I think I have to say, revisions to Sherman's volumes, including uh, his transcriptions, uh, there is now really a lot of documentary material available in, in other forms. And that has been a, a very useful source, I think, for everybody working on, on Raphael at the moment. 
I'd like to go back quickly, though, to one of the uh, points you were raising with with Catherine and with Matteo, the uh, this sense of kind of not being able to see things. Um, of course, we've all missed what we couldn't see, but we've so benefited and uh, that lack has fed into so much releasing of joy, I think, when people do get to see things. Uh, I'd be very curious to hear from Matteo um, the atmosphere on that last night when you were open through the night in Rome and, and also your final visitor numbers, because my recollection from a previous conversation is that despite such a difficult circumstance, even when you reopened with, was it six people admitted every five minutes? Um, you still managed to have a lot of people see your exhibition and come away uh, as thrilled as I think I was by it. Um, yes, the, the final number, the final figure of the um, attendance is uh, 165,000 which is my, I mean, of course, lower than other um, exhibition here, but perhaps our most, our biggest success because after all this, what happened. Uh, the last night atmosphere, I mean, if I remember, because I would have been confused, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't ask each visitor, of course, but uh, there was uh, um, the, people who reached the, the, the Quirinale, the people who was able to see the show, was a sort of a, a witness of what happened. So it was not only I mean, a, a private visitor, but also a, a, someone who could uh, tell around that, that the exhibition existed. And they, it, was, it was nice that people wanted also to go out from here and tell around what it was a show because there was a general awareness that no, um, not all the people could enter the building. Enter the building. I mean, we had an expectation for uh, 500,000, 600,000, and we had I mean, less than a third of it. So we, we, can, we can more or less calculate that two thirds of the people willing to, to see the show couldn't do that. So a lot of frustration but at the same time, of, I mean, a general comprehension of the circumstances. I think that the general atmosphere was positive, uh, and I'm very happy about that. I'm going to skip on just um, so we can talk about a few other aspects of, of this year. Um, obviously, there have been not only online programs and the exhibitions that have gone ahead, but number of publications too uh, that uh, have emerged and been published in, in, in the 500th anniversary year. Um, I, I suppose let me ask this broad question. Uh, Tom, you mentioned it, it when you were speaking before. Um, how far would you say the, the image of Raphael or the many images of Raphael uh, have changed since the anniversary exhibitions in 1983? It is, of course, a very big question. Um, it's a huge question. Uh, I think that one thing that is clearer now than it was in the past uh, is uh, the extent to which the workshop remained deeply controlled by Raphael. And um, again, harking back to comments on how he managed people, I think that was very extraordinary. The, um, the exhibition that the National Gallery is planning uh, aims to concentrate on Raphael in all his outputs across all of the career, um, but very much to concentrate on what that is, what that says about his aesthetic. Um, as such, it's been very careful to avoid issues of essentially authorship and, uh, and it's concentrated on really uh, unarguable central works by Raphael or works that he always envisaged being executed by other artists. And I think that a better understanding of that and indeed of the cross fertilization between the different arts as he developed simultaneously in the spheres of architecture, archaeology, designing for sculpture, tapestry, print. Uh, to take just one example, um, when designing the Sistine Chapel tapestries, uh, he gets interested in the use of offsets, a way to essentially reverse a drawing and, and see it, what, how it be when reversed. He was, of course, uh, simultaneously, uh, this was in the process of designing for the tapestries where he knew they would be reversed, 
So he's thinking how to get to that end point. Um, but also at a time when he's working closely with Marc Antonio, who would have had a press available and therefore the ability to press a drawing and reverse it in that way uh, becomes a very kind of natural thing. So you get this feeding in of different elements. I think that's um, a very strong aspect. I, I want to turn quite soon to any questions that we, we have, but let me ask the same question to, to you, Catherine. Um, I mean, do, do you want to add anything to, to Tom's sense of how our image of Raphael is, is developing at this time? I think we're very lucky in that a huge amount of work was carried out, you know, some of it coming to fruition in 1983, in the great 1983 year in terms of sort of taxonomy and cataloguing and, I mean, massively important publications that remain fundamental. So, you know, now, you know, we can very much build on those. There's always new discoveries. There are always new archival discoveries, but, you know, we can move further outwards in terms of making these connections, as Tom said, I mean, the workshop um, in terms also of the sort of bonds of friendship there, friendship and affection is, is another sort of strand that's really um, interesting to think about. Raphael's own um, intellectual strength and ambition were understood, you know, 40 years ago, so to speak, but more and more has been done in looking into those networks of his, again, um, sort of friendships and interactions with Rome, well, in Florence and in Rome, uh, with sort of intellectuals, writers, um, the sort of key people, like, you know, our understanding is, I think, advancing um, in these areas. And similarly, of course, and something that Matteo's exhibition delved into, you know, Raphael and the antique, which is such a fantastically rich um, area for more and more and more study. And again, it links up all of his interests because the, if you like, the, the, the public image of Raphael perhaps and the more, you know, the art historian's image of Raphael. And I guess perhaps the public image of Raphael might have been more about the, the painter of particularly, you know, the tender devotional images, perhaps, um, you know, the, the sort of the beauty and the grace and the harmony of his devotional images. But I think we, you know, more and more it's becoming evident um, beyond art history, you know, what a, what a complicated character Raphael was. I mean, he could be quite ruthless. He could be, you know, he was quite wealthy um, in a sense. Um, you know, we're just, there's, there's just so much more um, to, to develop in these different um, strands. Matteo, did you want it all in your presentation? Were you looking for different ways to challenge the received, the, the generally understood image of Raphael? Were you at all looking to provoke people or did you feel you had to give quite a canonical idea of, of Raphael? Uh, the exhibition was not canonical at all because it was organized backwards. So it was a sort of provocation in itself. At the same time, I think that a huge tribute in the year of the centenary wanted to, to keep him be a homage and not exactly a sort of a manifestation, only a manifestation of a, a new scholarship and the new, um, and also uh, the aim of a, a, a new understanding of Raphael perhaps was not at hand to the organizers of such an exhibition was too difficult in this period to compare this kind of uh, um, presentation to the to what happened in 1983. Uh, I think, I mean, uh, what was um, um, ambitious enough for us is to persuade again people about the richness, about the incredible universality of uh, Raphael art. And uh, uh, the idea of, um, as, as Tom and Kathleen told me, the brand of Raphael, and the importance of the brand of Raphael during all his life until the very last day of his life. And uh, Tom has a lot of merits to, 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 to fostering this, uh, this new comprehension after the exhibition of, in Madrid and, and Paris uh, mainly, but also with all the studies. So I think that the main uh, aim for us was to I mean, stay a step behind and let Raphael for one for once uh, in the years to, to be really the uh, something uh, um, um, self-standing in its greatness. And I hope we, we could do that. Can it, I come in briefly there, Tom, just to say, um, I don't expect to see an exhibition that does Raphael and the antique as well in my lifetime. I thought it was absolutely spectacular. And that the, the 
point perhaps uh, in what Matteo says that we've not talked about but absolutely deserves it is this um, bold decision to reverse the order of the life. So to start um, with the death and then to go through, what is it, nine, ten rooms before ending with uh, Raphael's youth in the last room. Um, I thought that was, I mean, it was bold, it was imaginative, I think a tremendous success, partly because um, it removed one from a teleological approach to Raphael of thinking that everything was leading to something else. Um, and that made it that one really concentrate on, for instance, the Raphael and the antique connections uh, as what they were at that time and not as somehow uh, building on something else. I, I think that's a really um, useful uh, addition, Tom. I, I wanted to draw back just slightly to the context of anniversaries before I take questions, because I suppose the title of this panel is whether this was a missed celebration, and I, I hope that to a certain degree our, our speakers have, have shown that it wasn't. But Catherine, you obviously uh, could have thought, well, Raphael Drawings, the exhibition, should have been in 2020. You, you did it in 2017. Tom, your exhibition due this year is going to be in, in 2022. I, I just wonder whether there's anything we can learn from the disruption of this year's major artist anniversary celebrations, you know, this was Raphael's year rather than Piranesi's perhaps, um, and whether, whether there's a feeling that perhaps our museum systems, our exhibitions, our publishing systems are a little bit too enthralled to this idea of the anniversary and whether we can learn anything from, from what, we've, what has been disrupted this year and what's been achieved. Catherine, let me ask you that. I mean, I think, as you say, anniversaries are always a little bit elastic. Um, at the Ashmolean, we've been celebrating Rembrandt's anniversary with an exhibition this year, um, you know, which opened, closed, but then reopened happily. Um, so there is this that elasticity. Um, but I think in general, probably what museums are thinking about and we all need to be thinking about is sort of what COVID has, you know, what effect that's going to have more broadly on the, on the exhibition culture, because, you know, not only the COVID climate, but also the notion of um, sustainability and generally greenness. We've managed to, a lot is now happening digitally. Um, you know, do we really want works of art to sort of travel all the time? Is that the right thing to do? Um, so should we be thinking more, as, as I think has often been said, getting away from the anniversary blockbuster and thinking more about uh, smaller, more focused exhibitions or, you know, exhibitions that work for, for the different institutions that do give the public something wonderful and do help to advance our, our own understanding and knowledge. So maybe we should get away from anniversaries entirely. I, fe I feel that one learns so much from a monographic exhibition that I hope that they will continue uh, and that we won't go to um, a, a kind of extreme overreaction to COVID impact on exhibition uh, planning. I hope that it's been clear in the things I've said that I uh, view an extended at Raphael anniversary as broadly a positive thing. I'm rather glad mm -hmm. that the nine conferences that I was meant to do this year are now spread out over about a 24-month period rather than a 12-month period. But I think it's also right to uh, comment on, on the losses. Uh, and I, uh, I think Certainly, Kath, I think Matteo as well would want us to acknowledge Joachim Jacobi, uh, who died this year, who was a leading Raphael scholar who had had a great deal to say, especially on the attribution of drawings um, in this year. And so one does feel uh, real losses as well as, can I say, imagined losses. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn to the Q&A box. Let, let me ask uh, this, just this first question, um, which is to Matteo, really. Um, what an effort it was to achieve some of those loans. And do you feel like there would ever be a possibility of bringing those works together again? It was kind of extraordinary, the, the extent of the loans from the Uffizi, for instance. Uh, well, I mean, the, the feeling was clearly that uh, it was one of the last occasions, um, for many reasons, uh, to put together so many crucial, important loans. 
for many reasons, not because of the importance of this anniversary. We have not, we are not facing a new one so very, very, very soon. Uh, and for the very, the, for, it's, it's not going to make sense again to move so many works uh, uh, very soon. And the behaviors in the, the exhibition um, system, it will be changing a lot in, also after COVID. And uh, so uh, we had really the feeling that also the responsibility to make a special effort to arrive as one of the last, uh, um, I mean, um, monumental exhibitions, uh, because we are moving forward a period in which perhaps they, they, they won't make sense again so much. And uh, it was difficult. I mean, making an exhibition has much to see with diplomacy and uh, it was very difficult uh, to put together the, uh, the all the interests of the, the different countries participate, participating to the show. But at the end, I think that um, very quickly in, in, in the dimension of a counter-attack, as I told you before, everyone understood that it was right to be, to be there, the, right, the, the, the place to be was uh, not a Scuderia, not my exhibition, but Rome in 2020. And especially after the idea of reopening the show. I mean, the, um, the consciousness of the importance of being there after in the reopening was w wider and stronger than the consciousness, the same consciousness and the official opening in March, I think. And this is a, a big success for the community and not only for us. I'm going to take this question that, that's just appeared in the chat box, which is uh, about um, this question about Raphael's death. And it, it is one of the odd things about uh, these anniversary years that obviously you, you can either time all these exhibitions around the birth and then you get another go a few years later, depending on how long someone lived around the anniversary of their death. Um, but the, uh, the question that comes in and says, there's been speculation about how Raphael died, whether he may, may have died of the plague, but obviously mortality has been, sadly, uh, very much in the air and on people's minds this year. Um, is there any feeling in which themes of mortality, the, the, the sense of mortality in Raphael's later, later work um, has been something people have been dwelling on this year? Uh, so, I'm not sure I would go quite in that direction. Um, uh, clearly, Raphael, who was not an old man when he died, um, we know that he was ill for, with a fever for about a week before he died. But otherwise, there was no premonition, no sense uh, that he was going to die. And as such, I wouldn't say that his late work, if we can even call it late work, um, was marked by that kind of aspect. Um, I think that the making the death the focus of the um, of the Rome exhibition was inspired. Um, it explained why this exhibition in this order in this year, um, and as such, made perfect sense. It's it was I've never seen anybody else try to tell a life back to front. Um, I think it perhaps Matteo worked less well in the catalogue, but in the exhibition, I thought it was absolutely convincing. Art historians always have to <laughs> have a little bit of criticism as well. Um, Catherine, let me ask you though, you talked about empathy, you talked about uh, interiority and things. I, I wonder if there are other aspects of um, Raphael's work and, and the type of characteristics that we assign or, or value in his work that, that somehow have felt um, more prominent or, or, or more empathetic for us this year. We felt more more that we wanted to look at them. Interesting. I mean, I suppose I feel listening as well to what Tom had just said, which I, which I agree with, and there is, you know, because of our own preoccupations, we read, you know, obviously relate then to Raphael and read into um, Raphael's work. And one can do this also with, with the drawings, very much so. Um, but I think stepping back for a moment, just this idea of Raphael as a still young artist who was cut off, his own preoccupations are there. I mean, all of the extraordinary um, 
you know, his, his exploration of the relationship of the virgin and child, of mother and son, is bound up with thoughts of impending death. And, and I think there is, you know, especially as we look at the drawings, because in the drawings he can be more adventurous, more experimental than the sort of the decorum of painting requires. One, one really sees him getting to grips with different kinds of emotion around mother and child and that sense of foreboding. But then equally in his treatment of the male nude, which is extraordinary, um, you know, one sees him in the drawings looking and feeling at, for what Michelangelo is doing, for example. But most extraordinary of all, I think, is Raphael's decision to produce something completely autonomous, not for a patron, not a commission, which is the massacre of the innocents which is this engraving, you know, engraved, but ra the intensity of Raphael's preparation for that shows him thinking about death in its most horrible forms, violence, brutality, the ferocity of the mother protecting her child. So I think there are a lot, you know, I think one can go in all sorts of directions um, in, the Raphael, in the Raphael year in thinking about these themes. But I think again, just going down that strand for a moment, it, it reminds us of the complexity of Raphael, the ambition of Raphael, and you know, his completely experimental approach to, to that kind of subject that was simply, it's, it's so original what he is doing, I think, um, in, in dealing with themes of, of, of death, violence, and brutality. Sorry, I've gone, off, I've gone off track from your question. That's okay, and I think uh, I'm afraid to say because I think that's a nice place to thinking of thinking about his originality, thinking mm -hmm. about his experimentalism. Uh, I, I know that there are other questions that are in the box, but I also know that London Art Week has two more events for people to come to tomorrow evening and the evening afterwards at the same time to hear more about Raphael and the Ran Raphael anniversary events. So I am going to stick to our brief and finish at an hour. And I'm going to say thank you very much uh, to Tom Henry, to Catherine Whister, Whistler, and to Matteo Lanfranconi. Uh, I hope that we'll all be able to do this type of thing again in person soon. But thank you all for listening. And I, I hope you enjoy what you've made of the year of Raphael, which, as we have heard, continues at least until 2022. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good night.